the 0-2. Swing and a miss, strike three. Wrap this one up in green and red. Hello, Railcats fans, and welcome back to another edition of the Railcats Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Savage, and today we are going to be talking about what the potential lineup for starting and starting pitching and what the batting order and fielding may look like. Now, I have to kind of, with the batting order, I have to kind of do two separate ones. Uh, just because on point streaks that is attached with the American Association, um, they have Jesus Mariaga as listed on the team, but he hasn't resigned quite yet. Um, and if he doesn't resign, <laughs> um, they're gonna have to find another outfielder because there's only listed two two more on there, which is LG Castillo and Lester Madden. Um, so the first one, when I go through the batting order, the first one is just. Um, uh, it is just without Jesus Mariaga, and the second one's going to be with Jesus Mariaga. Um, like I said, it, it's it's hard, it's easy for me to put the people in that I've already seen play versus like the new two people, um, like uh, Emmanuel Tappy uh, and then uh, Carlos Martinez, who both are newer. They they they're not. This is the first time in the American Association. Um, even if you look at Carlos Martinez, he's a veteran status. When when breaking down the the, the status, I, I was able to understand a little bit more. Um, they're going off like years of service, like of overall independent league, um, just not like in the American Association. So that's why he has a veteran status because he's been he played an independent ball. Um, so he he's been in independent ball for many years. So that's why he classifies a veteran. Uh, same thing with Emmanuel Tappy. Um, same thing on that aspect of it. But just kind of looking at um, getting t- sidetracked to what I was trying to get at. Um, I will have one of those two players in the lineup just because of pure. Uh, you kind of have to, and then uh, kind of going back and looking through why I want, what I want to do with the batting order and stuff like that, I have at least one of them in there. So before I get started with that, um, Paulie had a comment for me under my last podcast episode talking about Harrison Francis and how, you know, how we struggle with Chicago. So, you know, I said, you know what, let me go ahead and break it down real quick. And so that's what I did when I woke up today, Thursday, this is actually going to come out on Friday, but I had today off. So I was able to kind of get up and do what I needed to do and then record this podcast. So when you're looking at Harrison Francis, he did struggle mightily against Chicago. Chicago had his number. I mean, even, you know, he played in five games with them, but he started in four of them and lost three of those. Um, and one, he didn't even make it out of a third of an inning. Um, so looking at the, each individual game, um, May 14th was his first appearance ever that he made with the Railcats in a relief effort. Um, he pitched four innings, gave up three hits, three runs. Um, and uh, yeah, three hits, three runs all earned with a ERA of 675. Now, when I was going through this originally, I thought when I when when you went in and you went to point streak, they have a I, I don't like the way that works because they accumulate all of the so like let's just for instance, when I was going through the list, I was just I was like, "Oh, that ERA looks like it would be our, you know, I don't know quick math right off the top of my head." So, the ERAs if they score a run and so, you know, it just, I just assume that's what it was. But when I got to the August 11th game, he didn't give up a hit or give up a run, but he still had an ERA. So they just take the ERA and they just kind of knock it down or move it up per game. And they just kind of leave it there. So it's not like what the in game ERA was. So I had to do a little math on that one, but luckily they have an ERA cal- uh, calculator out there in the internet. Thank goodness. Cause I don't think I would be able to do it myself. Um, so I was able to figure out, what his actual ERA was against the Chicago Dogs this year. Um, but like I said, I'm getting sidetracked here. Uh, June 29th was his first start. He got the loss of that. He pitched in five innings, gave up six hits, four runs, three earned, um, two walks, two strikeouts, or six strikeouts, and an ERA of 5.40. In the July 10th start, he lost four innings, pitched, gave up eight hits, all um, 
eight hits, eight runs, which were all earned, four walks, four strikeouts, and ERA of 4.50. August 11th was his first win um, against the uh, against the Chicago Dogs. He pitched five innings, gave up five hits, no earned runs, one walk, four strikeouts. Uh, so that was probably, hands down, the best game that he had against the Chicago Dogs. But then you flip it on its head on the... Uh, a handful of weeks later, he played the Dogs again, and that was probably his worst outing against the Chicago Dogs. Uh, he pitched only in a third of an inning, gave up three hits, four runs, which were all earned, uh, four walks, one strikeout with an ERA of 108.1. Now, granted, that was just because, you know, he only pitched a third of an inning and gave up the four runs. By the total... If he would have pitched all nine innings the way he was going, they would have scored in 108 runs. Um, but he was obviously pulled. So this is what it kind of looks like uh, versus all those uh, those five games. He uh, he pitched in 18.1 innings, gave up 25 hits, 19 runs, 18 which were earned, 11 walks, 21 strikeouts with an ERA of 24.95. So obviously Harrison Francis did struggle against the Chicago Dogs. Um, which is kind of understandable. I mean, it's not like the Railcats really didn't struggle against them all year. And you could probably put benefit of the doubt uh, of just that aspect of it, that they just struggled against them pitching-wise, batting-wise, defensive-wise. They just all kind of struggled. I mean, there was a handful of good games, which you're going to get. Like I said, the Railcats were very competitive last year. So it wasn't a matter of that you could take, you know, Fargo Moorhead, who won the Miles Wolf Cup, and it wasn't the Railcats were competitive with every team they played. Now they had clunkers against every team they played, but I think that's just naturally how it goes. Everyone's going to have clunkers. I mean, the Milwaukee had a huge clunk against the Railcats, and they made it basically all the way. So it's not like every team's going to struggle along the way. It's what happens when you play a hundred games? You're going to struggle, and you know, looking at the American Association and then listening to uh, this week in the in the American Association, the podcast I was a part of last week. Anyways, they were talking about how they want the how the commissioner wants the league to be competitive. They want to bring in those big, uh, you know, veteran people, that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot more veteran like veterans as far as that have played. Um, ex MLB players, I, I should say. So they're trying to grow that. So every they're trying to get it to the point to where everyone is going to be competitive, and that's what we're starting to see. Is we're starting to gain all these forces, and, and they're starting to be more competitive. Well, yeah, you, you're granted. You're going to have, um, you know, uh, the the Doc Hounds are new, so they're new to the association. They're new. They're a new ball club. So it's going to take them a minute to kind of get that going. But once the American Association starts to grow and more ex players from the MLB era want to come down and play, you know, it could be veteran players. It could be just players um, that you know just don't feel like doing the 182 game grind anymore. They just want to play 100 games and kind of you know still play baseball, but enjoy their family a little bit that kind of stuff for, you know, whatever the, the, the case may be, the American Association is a place they want to go, you know, instead of like the Atlantic League, you know, come to the American Association. That's what that's what we're kind of battling with right now is, is that kind of portion of it. But from getting sidetracked to that is, I th- Harrison Francis may have struggled a little bit against one team. He may have struggled throughout some outings. I think it's just more consistency thing. You know, he is a, he is, he is a wild pitcher, but if he can control his, if he can hone in his craft, he can be more like you kind of started to see later in the season that you're getting more strikeouts and, uh, you know, betting or better games, he's going to be improved. So I'm, I'm wondering on this off season, what he's really worked on to hone in the, um, the strike zone, his control of his pitches, because he has good stuff. He really does. I, you know, his fastballs, curveball, that kind of stuff. He has good stuff. It's not like he doesn't have it. It's just he needs to hone it in a little bit, and he'll be a very good pitcher for the Railcats. Which I mean, the Railcats basically brought back their starting pitching. Um, 
except Leaf Strom, who got taken away from the Railcats with the Yankees organization. Uh, so that's the next that's the next segue I'm going to get into is what I think the starting rotation is going to look like. Now, I'm going to give you the ERA that ended at the end of the season for the Railcats in order from uh, from the five five pitchers from first to fifth. Right, we'll just we'll just go with the five game rotation. That's just I'm gonna put it at that. All right, so Chris Irwin starts off at number one, at four point zero one, ERA. Like I said in the last podcast, he was kind of he wasn't flashy. He was there. He did his job. He he did his job. Walked out the mound, and you kind of he wasn't over the moon like you gotta watch this. But I I think. After really looking ahead of season, I think this year, I, I think there's going to be a lot more put on him. And I think he's going to be a bigger spotlight with the Railcats. You know, looking at his numbers, you could say, well, why wasn't he an all-star? Why was Harrison Francis an all-star? You know, I think Harrison Francis, you get what drives people in batting or how should I say what drives attention towards pitchers is the ability to strike out people now granted you know you you get that portion of it where the I mean obviously ERA is a huge thing having the ability to control that kind of stuff catches people's eyes but it doesn't catch people's eyes if you're striking out a ton of people you know what I'm saying if you're averaging nine strikeouts a game when people are going to start looking at you even if you give up five or six runs people are still going to look at you so looking at chris Irwin having a 4.01 era he's more of that pitcher that you're going to get that's going to put the ball in play may not strike out a ton of people may not walk a ton of people but he's just going to give you what you need so i i think watching him closely I th- it, it, he could have another successful year and lead the Railcats in ERA um, as a starting pitching wise. Now there's other people that have higher or a little bit lower ERAs, but that's not starting pitching wise. So he he's a big tool, but I don't think I'm not probably gonna slot him number one f- for the ace role right now. Um, I'll, I'll leave that up for debate. I'll kind of look at that in a minute. But then going down to Adam Heidenfelder, he had a four point uh, four point five ERA. He was ultimately our workhorse for the Railcats. I mean, that's just who he was. He was the 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 workhorse. I'm pretty sure. Let me look up real quick. Um, oh, this is uh, just real quick on the um, innings pitched for um, everyone, and it was Adam Heidenfeld. So he was the work. I mean, he pitched 100 innings. Uh, so he was the workforce workhorse. For the Railcats, I think everyone kind of knew that he fell into that number one role and he was a guy that you could rely on as a an elite pitcher for the Railcats, that number one role. So when I look at it, I, I you're going to have to give it to Adam Heidenfelder to be that, that open day, opening day starter. I think he that's who he's going to be. He's going to be that opening day starter. He's going to take that the mound first and he's going to pitch first. That's who I believe. Unless they bring in someone that we, you know, unless they bring in another starting pitcher or if someone outworks him through the off season, which you know is always a good thing. You want that competition in the locker room, even even if it's among teammates. You want because that's going to push people to get better and better and better. So I, I don't necessarily think that I would put Chris Irwin over Adam Heidenfeller just be just based on his um, performance on the mound and how many innings he's able to take. He pitched a hundred innings. There's a hundred, hundred inning or hundred games a year. So you can average out. He pitched one game per inning, that kind of stuff, whatever you want to, however you want to spin it. But um, going down to John Sheeks, he pitched uh, an ERA of 4.64, Harrison Francis, 5.29, Edward Cuello at 12.27. Now, obviously, Cuello started out a little rocky just based on his first game he played. He got hurt. He gave up a lot of runs. He just wasn't what we saw in spring training. Now, could have that been the arm issue? Probably. But I, I, I'm I, going to put him as last in the starting rotation at that fifth role just based on those numbers. Um, 
you know, he could be different, but just based on the numbers that we saw and the little sample size we got, I don't think uh, Lamar Rodgers is going to come out and like, bam, you're opening day starter. I don't think, you know, he may shuffle around in the off season once we get back to the spring training, you know, once we see, once we get back in the spring training, um, probably have a bet better defined what I think is going to happen just based on those numbers. But like I said, everything can change. Uh, so at four, um, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to put Harrison Francis. I, I think, I think I'm gonna put Harrison Francis there. Um, yes, he was an all-star, but looking at his ERA numbers, you know, just looking at the wins, losses, um, I mean, he, he's tied with mostly everyone in the, in the wins, loss realm of things, but I think a lot of that was just because the Railcats offense just wasn't quite there yet. I mean, a lot of these games and a lot of these games kind of end up being high scoring. Um, I just, you know, he, he led the team in strikeouts, but John Sheeks is only one strikeout behind him in that portion of it. Um, he, besides, besides Nick Garcia, he gave up the most runs, um, out of the Railcats organization. So, and I'm just going to go with yeah, I'm going to have to go with him at four. Um, I think he has the potential to be really good. I think he just needs to hone in a little bit better and he can be that more efficient. You're going to get that, obviously, with a person that likes to th strike people out. He's going to put it in the strike zone and people are going to hit it eventually. It just got to figure out a way to maneuver around those people that can hit the ball and learn to strike them out on balls. That makes sense. Um, and then... Uh, Number three, uh, I'll go with John Sheeks. Um, just based on, yeah, he pitched 100 innings, or just under 100 innings. Uh, you know, another workforce, but I, I think people are, I, I still, I guess I'll, I'll run through the next two, um, which you already know who my number one's going to be. But just, so you can probably figure it out that Adam Heidenfeller first and Chris Irwin second. I just think with Chris Chris Irwin, yeah, he pitched um, a handful more games, you know, less than John Sheeks did. Uh, but just looking at his amount of the his ERA, his um, earned runs, you know, runs he just gave up in general. Like I said, I think he's just more of that person that's going to give you. And, and, and on top of it, there was five games where he was a relief pitcher. So there was five potential games that were taken away from him to catch up to John Sheeks or Adam, Adam Heidenfelder. I mean, he only started in 15, Adam Heidenfelder, John Sheeks, Harrison Francis, they all got 18 or 19. Um, Edward Quay was the only other one that, you know, didn't, I, I, you could potentially throw Nick Garcia in that realm, but I think it was just out of necessity that the, he was put in in that position just because they ran out of starting pitching and they don't think they really started, didn't really look for starting pitching because starting pitching is just sometimes kind of hard to fill in the middle of the season, that kind of deal. So, the, I mean, I, I John Sheik's very great pitcher. I think he brings a lot of force and pizzazz and what you need with the rail cats, but I just think him slotted at the third just based on his ERA is not a terrible thing. Like I said, this is just preliminary. It doesn't mean this is how it's going to rotate out. I mean, realistically being a starting pitcher with the rail cats organization doesn't quite mean that you're not going to be a reliever at one, some point or another, you know, you may not just stay there. I mean, realistically looking at it, the only person that wasn't, a relief pitcher in any role at any time was John Sheeks. He played in 18 games, had 18 games started. Outside of that, everyone else had some kind of a re relief role. I guess, my bad, Edward Quayle, he went 11 for 11. So I take that back. So two people out of the entire Railcats organization for pitchers, that's what you got. I mean, those are the only two that weren't a starting, you know, you don't see that at MLB. You don't see that in other teams where they're going to be a starting pitcher and a reliever. Um, so that's what I'm going to go with that one. So like I said, Adam Heidenfelder, 
Chris Irwin, John Sheeks, Harrison Francis, and Edward Cuello. I think that's what you're going to see your starting rotation to be out. I could be wrong. They could bring someone else and completely, completely wrong. Who knows? It's only February. I The, game, the season doesn't start until May. So we still got plenty of time. Now looking at the order of which I think how it's going to play out for the Railcats, their batting order, and where their position's going to be. Now, looking back through the last handful of games where most of these players were with the Railcats, Lamar Rogers jumped a lot of people around. Uh, Daniel Lungua is probably one of them. He started, he was leadoff, he batted last. He jumped around a whole lot. But in my personal view, if you were just going to leave a lineup, how starting day was going to look, and looking at everyone else, this is how I would have it. I would have Michael Woolworth at first, or Michael Woolworth with leadoff at second, Daniel Lungual hitting second, starting shortstop. Victor Nova, Victor Nova. Now he is not; he's an infielder. But at the way the current roster is struck is is constructed, we don't have any more outfielders. And LG Castillo played a lot of left when he was with the Railcats. And Lester Madden is the only other one. And I don't trust Lester Madden enough to play a left or center field, so I'm going to put him right. Not saying that's a bad thing being in the right field, because as a player, I enjoy the outfield. And when you get into the bigger leagues, you're going to have left-handed batters, Sam Abbott, who can hit into that right field portion of it. But I'm just if I'm going to slot him somewhere, that is where I'm going to slot him. I don't think he has the speed to play center. I don't think he has arm strength to play left, which is kind of weird to say because normally your stronger arms in right field. But there wasn't a lot of play from right field necessarily with the Railcats um, over the course of the season because most of the time the ball went to right field and it went over the fence. Um, most of the other times it was left field and center field is what you're kind of ranging at here. Um, so I'm going to put in Victor Nova there. I, he doesn't have the strongest arm necessarily. I don't think he does, but I think he's speedier than both LG Castillo and, um, uh, Lester Madden. So I'm going to put him said just based on his pure speed ability. I, I mean, you could probably put LG Castillo in center field and put Victor Nova in left. I just know that that's a, totally different area to play from left to center so i would just kind of take the guy that really hasn't played a lot of outfield necessarily and put him in center field um it's not necessarily easier to judge the ball to a certain extent but with the speed you can kind of make up a little bit on that portion of it i know it's kind of counterproductive a little bit i know i'm kind of jumping around a lot but that's the only thing that makes sense. In my mind, I guess, when I'm looking at the roster, that's the only thing that makes sense is to do that. So that's what I'm going with. What I think makes sense, obviously, if you disagree with any of this, I would love to hear your feedback. I'd love to have this kind of discussion. I mean, even going back with the Harrison friends, if there's numbers that you want me to try and figure out uh, for another podcast uh, of a player against a certain team or a certain series, I'd love to do that. I, I, I'm Give me something to think about, especially in the you know the new future of Railcats podcast in the off season. This is kind of stuff that I can keep in the memory bank, so I can work on that kind of stuff in next off season. Um, but going down to four is going to be LG Castillo in left field, and the reason I put him fourth is because he had basically at the end of the year one of the better batting averages of the Railcats, and he could probably hit for power. So I'll put him in that role. Of fourth, I mean, you could probably interchange him with Nova going to fourth. You know, you don't necessarily need um, a power hitter. I mean, you could probably move Sam Abbott up there, you know, a power hitter be in that um, grand slam role. You don't necessarily need that. You just need someone that's going to be able to drive people in. That's what I, I understand the cleanup hitters that clear the bases, clean up, you know, but sometimes I take that role as someone that has a 
one of the better batting averages to bring in people because obviously if you have four people on base and you at least get a single, you're going to guarantee at least run maybe two runs and you hit a double, you're guaranteeing two runs and potentially a third. So, I, you know, I just need, you want someone that when you have ducks on the pond that he's going to be that productive person that you need that may potentially hit the ball one out of three times or two out of four times, however the case may be in that in that aspect. Then um, I'm going to go with Thomas Greeley as catcher. Now, when I go to the next one, you're going to kind of like, well, well, that doesn't make any sense. But don't worry. Just, uh, let me work on it real quick. And then number six is going to be Sam Abbott at first base. Um, like I said, they are loaded with first basemen. They're just absolutely loaded with them. Um, when you look at the infield rosters, you have Sam Abbott, Sherman Graves, Daniel Lingual, Victor Nova, Emmanuel Tapia, and Michael Woodwork. Abbott, Graves, Tapia are all first basemen, right? So I, I don't – there's just a lot of first basemen there. There's a ton of first basemen, and one of them could, could eventually be turned into outfielder. I just, like I said, I don't know enough about Tapia to kind of put him in that role yet. I, I, I don't know him yet. I don't know. he He's a veteran. He's an older gen. I mean, he's, I get older. I say older, and he's my age. I, well, he's 26. I uh, almost going to be turning 27 here shortly. Actually, on the 26th of this month, he's actually going to turn 27. But. I don't know quite enough, you know, with that veteran presence. Maybe he'll be better at, at third or whatever the case may be. But at first, at least, I'm going to put Sam Abbott there. And then I'm going to put Sherman Graves uh, just because I've seen him play. And I, I know what kind of bat he bring he can bring. There is a huge, yes, I understand there's a huge difference between playing first and third. But a lot of third basemen can play first and a lot of first basemen can play third. So that's just an interchangement. Just strictly because with this, I don't have Jesus Mariaga on the on the roster. And obviously, Jesus Mariaga would take that center field role and that would bring Nova to third. So then we wouldn't have to worry about taking a first baseman and throwing him over there. As I think there's going to be a big rotation at first in DH, just looking at the roster alone with the, with the people that are here. Um, a lot of it isn't a defensive substitution, which I think... He's gonna. I, I really think Lamar Rogers needs to get a handful more people just strictly for uh, a substitution in the field somewhere. I think he needs at least two more outfielders so you can have a substitution of some sort uh, when it comes down to, you know, I'm not saying that I if a fly ball goes out to Lester Madden, I'm going to trust him to catch it. So in a, in a tight game, you may need to bring someone in. Uh, prime example would have probably been Alec Oled, but uh, you know, he, he's with Fargo and he's doing better things, whatever, however you want to roll that one out. But it's just someone like that, you know, you can bring in someone that can play defensively in a position versus the offensive player. Like I said, we're, you're starting to get all these offensive numbers and their defense isn't the greatest. So you, sometimes you need to counterbalance that out. But yet again, what do I know? Um, Sherman Graves at third and then eighth I have Carlos Martinez and he is actually doing really well right now um in the winter ball right now um I think it's the um Columbia Winter League right now he is actually batting a 336 right now um he has uh 21 RBIs four home runs nine hits uh, 41 runs on 25 uh, at bats. So, or, or, well, hold on. Oh, 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 my bad. He has my bad. <laughs> he has 122 at bats. Um, yeah, 25 runs and 41 hits. So I, you know, just seeing what he's going going at right now, and then what he did with the Frontier League last year. I, I'm probably going to slot him at the DH role just with the the way the roster is constructed right now. And then Lester Madden in right field, he didn't have the best batting average um, and not really that trustworthy of a person in right field. Um, but, but now let's just say hypothetically, or if it does happen sooner or later, um, where Jesus Mariaga, now I know they're playing in the tournaments and I think it's part of the Columbia Winter League. Um, got to watch a little bit of it. 
um, just never know when it's on, and I'm always busy at work or cooking dinner. I never catch it. And with it being hockey season, if the Blackhawks are playing, and you know, besides the point, I know he's doing really well. I think he went three for five in his last game that he played, which was a couple days ago. Um, with uh, actually with Columbia, I believe it is. Um, so interesting to see on that portion of it. Uh, where how, but I'm getting all getting all sorts of jumbled up. I may apologize. What I'm getting at is that the theory may be that Jesus Mario is not going to resign until after the tournament is over. And like I said, like the um, Rob and Kevin said um, in this week in the Minnesota Association, the Railcats, this is abnormal for, I, th- I think they said 17 players resigned. I think it is. I, I don't do quick maths. 17 players resigned. And 15 of those players resigned in one day. It's That's unheard of. Which I'm surprised it doesn't happen more because you know what your roster is construct of. And then you can start working on planning and different things like that. So I'm I'm shocked that we haven't heard anything from Adam, he- Adam Heidenfelder yet. And I guess I should have I shouldn't have put him in the pitching rotation role. I, as now thinking of it, that he hasn't resigned yet. But he's going to resign, so don't worry about it. If not, then we're stuck with Nick Garcia, and then everything moves around. So just take it as what it is um, if he resigns. Um, so, yeah, I, whatever. I, I screwed that one up. I, I, I tripped over that branch. Um, but looking at what the roster would look like if Jesus Marigag is on with the team, uh, number one would be Woodworth, second base, Lingua playing shortstop. LG Castillo will move up into that third role. And then at, to left field. And I would put Jesus Mariaga in that cleanup role at center field because that's what he was normally playing or batting order-wise when Lamar when he was in the lineup. And that's where Lamar Rodgers would put him just because I think when he came in, he was so offensively driven, so productive. Yeah, he wasn't hitting the ball out of the park all the time, but he was getting people and drove them in. And then uh, Victor Nova at five at third base. And then I have Carlos Martinez as a catcher batting sixth and the reason i say that is just because of looking at his numbers compared to thomas Greeley's numbers it's hard not to put a guy in that is batting a whole hundredth better than the other person so and he's a little bit older so he brings that veteran presence to him now maybe he ends up being more of a th role because he is an older person but he's my age I, I hate when I hate that. I hate that I'm getting that old and starting to realize that, you know, not saying that technically in baseball, 26 is not old because baseball, I mean, once you hit the 36 to 40, you, you're, you're old. But I'm just saying in the realm of the American Association, that's a little bit older, an older player. Um, and then I have Sherman Graves at the DH role. Um, I think he has the offensive presence to be in a DH role that it's kind of hard to take him out of the lineup because what he did, especially against his old team, he has those streaks of he putting it together. He can strike lightning. I think if he puts a consistent full year in, I think he could be very productive in the offensive batter's box. And then I have Sam Abbott at first. Like I said, it, he brings a lot of power. You know, Lamar Rogers really had him in that sixth to seventh role. But when I'm looking at the roster, I would rather put him in the second cleanup position at eight because if everything works out, you know, he may have the bases loaded. That kind of it's not necessarily a bad thing to be batting towards the back end of it. Um, if a lot of these players can get on base and he can just clean it out and then kind of restart it. Um, but I would put Matt Lester Madden at ninth. Um, playing right field again just because his batting average wasn't quite there and defensively he's not the stoutest person there um so that's how i would roll my lineup out in an opening day if you disagree would love to hear you know what your lineup would look like with the players that we have um if you have any like yeah you're just off the wall on that one which is fine if i'm off the wall on something let me know because you know it's still a learning curve it's not like the mlb where everyone's talking about it every day everyone has different opinions that's why i like to have this podcast so we can have friendly conversations and get an idea and, and grow the, the the gary south shore rail cats in the eyes of the united states of america or, or just the american association and the american association in general um but yeah so 
I think that's it. I think I covered everything that I wanted to cover in this week's podcast. I'm not sure what I'm going to do next week. So if you have an idea, leave it out there. And by Friday, I'll have another podcast out. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and figure something out. I'm not, you know, sometimes I like to live in the moment. I'm not, you know, right then and there. Um, maybe I'll just take a player profile, kind of break down a player um, or whatever the case may be. But yeah. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of the Railcast Talk Podcast. I'm your, ho- I'm your host, Kyle Svesh. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe of the podcast on YouTube. Be sure to go to Facebook and Twitter at Railcast Talk. Uh, follow there where I can up- I upload more stuff than just the podcast. Um, but then if you want my personal Twitter handle, it's Svetich, um, which is just K and then S-V-E-T-I-C-H, which is my personal one where I kind of retweet stuff or just put different sports, that kind of stuff. It's just my personal handle. Uh, on that portion of it but outside that's going to wrap it up for me so i hope you enjoyed today's podcast um so yeah enjoy the rest of your day rest of your evening wherever you're watching this and uh okay.